Well, good evening. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening, for bringing us here. Lord, we pray that you would uh, enter into this building. Lord, you would fill this room and this place with your glory, with your spirit, Lord, and draw us into your presence. I pray that each one of us, Lord, would surrender to, to you and who you are, what you've done. Lord, lay our burdens at your feet. Lord, lay this world down. Leave it behind as we just pursue you, Lord. Pour your spirit out. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song.
take the wings of the morning and dwell in the depths of the sea. Even there, your hands forever leading me. You're leading me, Lord. Search my heart and make me pure. For I am yours forever. Lord, search my heart and make, make me pure. For I am yours forever. Sing, I am yours. I am yours. I am yours forever. I am yours. I am yours forever. Lord, search my heart. Father, as we sing about it tonight, Lord, that uh, forever we belong to you because, Lord, we're bought and paid for by your blood, by your sacrifice. And we rest in that tonight. We ask that you be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening on the radio and online. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, there's no home fellowship coming up this coming Sunday uh, because... Uh, 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 Grace and I will be traveling and <clears throat> won't be able to be there, so uh, we'll pick that up uh, the following Sunday, uh, which is like, what, the uh, 13th? And so, but looking forward to uh, everyone being able to have communion together that evening, and so uh, make, it, make it a plan to, to come uh, Sunday evening for communion. And then uh, women's discipleship has been put off also uh, for another week, and so on the 10th and 11th of uh, the week after next, uh, ladies will begin their uh, women's discipleship study again, and... Um, uh, that's about it. <laughs> Father God, thank you for the opportunity once again uh, to worship you. And we pray that you be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Yeah. 
sing that again. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I am found.
Father, it's our desire, Lord, it's our prayer, Lord, to be yielded wholly, completely to you, to be 100% surrendered. Yet, Lord, we know there's just parts of our lives that are hard to give up, parts of our lives, Lord, that we're just, we try, Lord, but would you meet us where we're at, Father? Would you help us, Lord, to surrender the rest and to trust wholly in you? We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, welcome you guys. God bless you. I want you to turn and say hello to each other real quick. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's good to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, you know, the, uh, tonight we're going to do an overview of the book of Galatians. And uh, the overviews are always fun. Uh, they're kind of fast moving. Uh, but this one won't be quite as fast just because, uh, hey, you know, it's only six chapters versus 150 chapters of Psalms. So uh, we don't have to fly quite so fast. But I thought that we would read uh, Galatians chapter 1 together, and then we'll get into the actual study. And so if you open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 1, uh, we'll read that together, and, and then we'll get into uh, the study itself. And so, um, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me in reverence for God's Word as we uh, read it together? Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached uh, to you, let him be accursed. And as we've said before, and so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what, was, uh, what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me uh, is not according to man. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being far more exceedingly jealous or zealous uh, for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw, another, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, uh, indeed, uh, before God, I, I do not lie. And afterwards I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only, uh, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Gracious Father, we pray that you'd be glorified tonight, Lord, and that you would speak to our hearts and that you would reveal yourself afresh. And that, Lord, help us to kind of, in a way, get the bigger picture. Help us to see the whole thing in its totality, Father, and to understand and comprehend uh, this letter to the Galatians, Lord, actually, this letter to us. And so guide us, Lord, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Welcome. You can be seated. 
Well, uh, I'll give my standard um, a disclaimer uh, before doing any overview. Uh, as I was studying through this today, uh, preparing for tonight, uh, it's very, very tempting to go back through verse by verse and just cover all the cool stuff that God showed us. But we're going to kind of go through, uh, kind of uh, cherry-picking uh, some of the um, major topics throughout uh, this book. Uh, the first thing is, um, uh, this book was written to the churches of Galatia, plural, and, uh, and not just like uh, one city like Ephesus or Colossae, but uh, Galatia is a region uh, of what is today modern-day Turkey. And um, you can see over here on this map, I think you can see uh, this green area up to the right hand uh, of what is today uh, Turkey, that's the region of Galatia. And there were a number of churches in this area uh, that Paul had uh, traveled to, actually these towns, and, uh, and he started Bible studies there, he started ministering to people, uh, he went into some of the synagogues, if there were synagogues, and, um, and he just began preaching the gospel of Christ. And a number of these people, uh, most of them Gentiles, uh, came to know the Lord. And as uh, believers kind of got together, uh, he continued to minister to them, he discipled them, and then he left them with people in charge. Said, okay, now you're the pastor, so to speak. And, uh, and he would leave, go to the next town, and go to the next town. And, uh, and basically all these, these fledgling churches uh, were started in Galatia. And uh, sadly, as Paul left to uh, start other churches, uh, these different men would come in. Uh, we refer to them as Judaizers. And, and they tried to kind of keep Christianity as a sect of Judaism. In other words, they said you had to be kind of a, a good Jew before you could be a Christian. And so they were trying to tell people, you know, it's not just the faith alone that saves you, it's faith and keeping of the law, you know, in its various forms. And so uh, this letter is written essentially to combat that. Uh, this letter was written right around between 57 and 60 AD uh, by Paul when he was probably in his uh, uh, third trip to Corinth. And as we go through this letter, or at least as he introduces himself, uh, he cites three basic sources of authority as he addresses the churches there in Galatia. Uh, the first thing is he says, uh, he, he declares his apostolic authority, which is granted by Jesus and God the Father, that he is an apostle on the same uh, level, if you will, as Peter, James, and John, and the rest of them, and, uh, and that he spent his time uh, being discipled by Jesus. Uh, he claims authority as a spiritual father uh, over these different uh, churches and believers because he's the one that brought the gospel to them. Uh, he's the one that shared the good news of Jesus Christ, and they, you know, he led them in a sinner's prayer, if you will. And, and so he was uh, very much involved uh, in their salvation at the beginning. Uh, and then he cites the word of God as his authority. Uh, the gospel itself is authoritative and not the contriving of man, but of God. And so uh, in the churches, there were, again, these false teachers that uh, followed Paul and, uh, and started uh, tearing down the work he'd brought in and uh, started disparaging Paul and contradicting his teachings and different things. And so he's writing this letter back to them uh, to encourage them in their faith. Um, the theme of this book uh, is uh, liberty, uh, the liberty of Christ versus the bondage of the law, or perhaps uh, grace, uh, the grace of God and justification by faith. Uh, the key verse, I think, in this, that kind of encapsulates this entire book is uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, uh, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And so Paul is very clear. I mean, several times through this book, and, and there are many other references we could go to uh, that declare pretty much the same thing. And, you know, I would quote uh, Jesus in, in John chapter 6, uh, verses 28 and 29. Uh, at one point, Jesus was asked by a scribe, uh, a representative of the Pharisees, you know, what works must we do uh, to be saved? You know, because they were in a, in a works uh, mentality, the salvation by works and so forth. And Jesus responds uh, in uh, John chapter 6, verse 29, and he said to them, this is the work singular of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And, and, and that's the only actual work that any of us can do, if you want to even call it that, is that we just simply take God at his word that we trust the Bible, that we trust our Lord Jesus to have completed that good work. Anyone who uses the word uh, and after believes, you know, believe and, uh, is talking about religion, about a false gospel, about a man-made religion. 
And, you know, people sometimes will kind of, and I, and I say this, you know, lightly, I think, or not too seriously, but, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you're very religious, you know, or, or, or you really care about your religion. And I know what they mean. They're, they're talking about spirituality in general and things like that. But I really do uh, take note of when people say that, go, no, 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 I'm not into religion. In fact, religions are man-made. What I'm into and what I love, I love my Lord Jesus and I have a personal relationship with him. And so I want to really emphasize to people because I talk to people that are burned by religion all the time. I mean, I had a, a, a two-hour discussion with my brother yesterday or the day before yesterday, and, and he was talking about his frustrations uh, with the religion that we were brought up in. And that was, it, it was such a cool opening to be able to show him, no, we're talking about a relationship, a personal relationship with the true and the living God. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is uh, talking about in this particular book. We'll go through chapter by chapter, and, and starting here with chapter 1. What I kind of did is I went through each chapter. I kind of tried to kind of put a synopsis, if you will, uh, or a heading for each chapter. And, uh, and chapter 1 is just the typical Pauline salutation. And then he gives a, a warning or an admonition uh, in, in the midst of this. But in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, uh, but through Jesus uh, Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so the first thing I noted was, I love this, it, it's Paul, not Saul. Uh, he got a new name because he's a new man. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. He's not the man that he once was. He's completely changed and different. And, and I like this because he, he'll go on kind of sharing his testimony through this chapter. But, you know, a guy that tried to destroy the church is now one of the more prominent leaders of the church. And, and this is so cool. And it, 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 it embodies what uh, he would later write to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, you know, uh, that's what I love about my Jesus. You know, he gives us a second chance. And he gives us a, a fresh start and a, and a clean slate with him, uh, being that new creature. Uh, in verse 3, it says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you know, who gave himself for our sins in verse 4. But this is kind of the typical uh, Pauline, if you will, salutation, uh, grace and peace. Uh, grace, uh, or the word charis in Greek, uh, is the typical Greek salutation. Uh, peace, uh, shalom, is the, the atypical uh, Hebrew or Jewish salutation. Um, and it says, you know, grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he kind of combines these two things. He's, he's talking to a mixed group. And, um, and, and I like this because, uh, you know, again, grace is the typical Greek salutation. And, uh, and to define that a little bit, you know, grace is simply God's unmerited favor. You know, getting something good that we don't deserve and could not earn on our own. And so grace is a key word, you know, in this particular letter. Now, uh, the word peace, and, and, and Typically, the word peace is defined as an, as an absence of conflict or hostility. It can mean quietness or stillness or rest. And, um, and while the thought and the intent is shalom, uh, the word that's used here is irene, uh, which is uh, literally peace in the Greek. And, um, but it's more than just a lack of hostility or, or a lack of conflict. When someone says shalom to you, it means all that and more. It, 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 it's a, it, an all-encompassing uh, kind of a blessing. You know, peace to you, yes, uh, but health and strength and vitality, you know, to you. Life, you know, and the essence of life and, 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 and the fullness of life be granted unto you. And so, you know, if someone walks up to you like that, I mean, it'd be one thing to walk up and shake some of the guy's hand or give him a little peck on the cheek, but when they stand back, with, grab you by the shoulders and say, you know, peace to you, peace with God and the peace of God prosperity and strength and life be unto you, you know, and, and they kind of go down the list of all the adjectives and stuff. It's like, whoa, you know, it, it means more than just, I'm not going to beat you up today, you know, I like that. And so, uh, or, or don't beat me up or whatever. But um, so, you know, typically Paul gives the same kind of salutation through most of his letters, and it's always grace first, then peace, because you can't know the peace of God until you know the grace of God. And so it's always in that order. Then he, he gets down to business here in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. 
And, and Paul is amazed that having heard the truth, that they are so easily turned to the lies of the world. And it baffles me. You know, I've seen people that have become Christians, uh, that, that realize that they're sinners, that they realize that they need a Savior, and they begin to walk in the, in the truth of, of, of God's Word and all those things, and then somebody will distract them, somebody will lure them away or, or lie to them or tell them different things, and they're just like, oh, okay, and they're not grounded enough, seemingly, to hang on to the truth. But, you know, when you've been lied to a lot in life, and you finally find the truth, you hang on to that. And, and it always kind of baffles me when people don't. And, and Paul is kind of expressing the same thing. I marvel, I'm amazed, you know, that having heard the truth, you're going to give that up. You know, in verse 7, it says, uh, referring to verse 6, you know, to a different gospel, verse 7, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's what you see happening. Uh, the Judaizers are attempting to pervert or, or to, to, to distract from the gospel, the good news. Because any other news, if you will, any other gospel really isn't the gospel because they've either added some work to it uh, or, or they've taken you know, the, the grace of God or the redemptive power of Jesus from it, and it's not the same. You know, it, it's not the gospel. It's not the good news. In verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And so, you know, Paul kind of says, hey, if, if anybody changes or perverts what you know to be the gospel, which has been preached to you, uh, they're preaching a different gospel, don't listen. You know, stick with the original, if you will. And he said, even if an angel from heaven... Now, he's talking about a, an angel, a messenger that represents it, itself as being from heaven. And you know what? There are, there are wicked, evil, bad angels out there that will do that. You know, they'll show up in, in, in shining light and all this kind of stuff. Oh, wow, you know. But listen to the words. You know, you, you got, we've got to be uh, discerning. Um, any angel that comes with a false message uh, is a different gospel. Don't believe them. You know, the Holy Spirit warns us about false teachers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He's the deceiver. And so we have to exercise discernment. You know, we're, we're called to, uh, to, to, to examine what's being said. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. I, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. When I was a younger believer, and, and, I, and I saw these warnings about, you know, uh, uh, angels transforming themselves into angels of light. I was kind of scared because I wasn't, you know, and I knew that I wasn't really all that grounded in God's Word, and I was kind of concerned about an angel appearing to me, you know, uh, mimicking Jesus, if you will, and, you know, and, and my offering false worship or, or worship to that being, you know, stupidly or whatever, and I was concerned about being deceived. Uh, that was my point. And um, as I continue to, to, to grow in God's Word and, and you know, hopefully to mature as a Christian, that fear kind of faded away because I, I've, I've spent the last 30 years trying to learn the voice of my Lord, trying to understand His ways. And, and I know that we can compare the things that we hear, whether it's from a human being or from your TV set or from you know, an angel or whatever, whether it's consistent with what the Word of God says. You know, the Holy Spirit's in us, and he gives us the ability to discern those things. And you may not always be able to put your finger on chapter and verse, but the Holy Spirit will protect us and guide us in these things. And so we have to be discerning and even ask the question at times. But, you know, anyone or anything or any being that is truly of God will not contradict the Word of God, period. God doesn't, God doesn't contradict himself. And so we need to test what's said against the Word of God. You know, when we look at the practices of the church today, we have to kind of consider, well, is what the church is doing today, is this of God? I mean, is this what God has called us to? And I know different churches have, you know, different styles of, of worship, sometimes different styles of teaching, or, you know, the, the, the services are kind of, you know, different orders and things. And, and, and I believe there's a lot of liberty in Christ, and there's a lot of liberty in, in denominationally and that kind of stuff to do different things, because God uses a wide variety of things. But there are some things that are consistent. 
you know, when we, again, look at these practices, we have to examine them in light of, did Jesus talk about this in the Gospels? You know, or did Jesus demonstrate this in his life? Did the Church of Acts practice the different things that we do? Uh, do Paul's teachings describe or address, you know, the various aspects of church life, if you will? You know, and, and again, uh, we, we try to be consistent with what we read in, in our Bibles. Those who preach another gospel, those who try to turn God's people from the revealed truth of God's word, uh, from his grace, uh, it says right there, you know, in black ink in my Bible, man, it says, may they be anathema. You know, may they be accursed. And I've, I've seen and heard lots of false teachers out there that are saying all kinds of stuff. And I've even heard people just boldly say, well, you know, uh, who, who are we to limit God to his word? And they go on about, you know, different things that, you know, supposedly God would say or do. It's like, no, 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 God will not contradict himself. And so, you know, the, the word accursed is very strong or anathema. It describes divine condemnation, you know, given over eternally to hell. It's like, wow, you know, we really got to be careful with that. And then to make the point, in verse 9, it repeats almost the exact same thing. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that, what you've received, let him be accursed. And so he's really kind of making a point. Now, the rest of this chapter, Paul kind of goes on to share uh, his personal testimony and talks about his time of preparation, or actually what it boils down to is his personal discipleship with Jesus. I mean, I, I, I've thought many times, man, it would have been so cool to be one of the 12, you know, to, to, to follow Jesus around for those three years, you know, and all the things that they saw and learned and everything else. But Paul had one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus for three years. Like, that is cool. And so, again, this is another uh, aspect of authenticating, if you will, uh, his apostleship. Uh, that brings us now to uh, chapter 2. And in uh, and, and chapter 2, I just kind of put the heading, uh, Justification by Faith. You know, that's really what this chapter is all about. You know, uh, Paul waited uh, three years after his conversion uh, before he returned to Jerusalem. And he was there for about 15 days, as the previous chapter said. Uh, he spent that time conferring uh, with Peter. And, and then he left. And then after 14 years, he, he comes back to Jerusalem where they're having this council, uh, which is convened about uh, what would be required you know, of the Gentiles. You know, do they have to keep the law and all that kind of stuff? And so it's been 14 years since uh, Paul's been back in Jerusalem, but he's back now for this council. And, uh, and he begins to describe some things that take place after that. Uh, in verse 11, uh, we kind of pick it up where Peter has come to Paul uh, in Antioch. And in verse 11, it says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, uh, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Now, that, this is kind of interesting because uh, most people, when you read the Bible, you want to talk about the church, and everybody gets along. You know, everybody just makes nice, nice all the time, and, and, uh, and there aren't any problems. But this kind of portrays the fact that, you know what, there was a problem. And we have these two heavy hitters, uh, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. They're not just in a, in a, in a back room privately talking about something. They're in front of the congregation, <laughs> and they're having some issues, and it's being kind of hashed out uh, then and there. And, and some of Paul's critics were saying, well, you know what? Uh, Peter and James and John, you know, they're like the real apostles. They're the real deal. And, you know, Paul's kind of a you know, uh, not an imposter, but, you know, he's a self-appointed kind of guy, or he's not really in the same league as Peter, James, and John. But as Paul, as Paul publicly corrects or rebukes Peter, I would say so much for Paul's inferiority. <laughs> you know, he proves in a certain sense because Peter receives the rebuke, number one. You know, he didn't go, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> and quote some scripture. He goes, he just kind of hung his head and said, yeah. You know, and, he, and he, he, there's, no, there's no rebuttal there. And so, Again, that's kind of, to me kind of uh, uh, you know, intriguing in a way, and, and it makes a point. Then in verse 16, again, we come to the, what I think is the main verse for this whole book. Uh, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in, in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And so even though nobody could really keep the whole law, I mean, James tells us if you, if you, you know, try to keep the whole on, you, you, you break it at one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. And so no one can actually keep the law, but even if they did keep the law, nobody will be justified by the law. You know, Paul tells us in Romans 1.17, for in the righteousness of God is revealed 
from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The only way to be just justified is by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and that's how Abraham was justified. You know, Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. And so um, an important uh, point to understand. Uh, in verse 20, and, and to me this is just a fascinating verse, uh, in verse 20 he says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And, and what Paul is declaring here is, now the law has no power over me. I'm dead. I am crucified in Christ Jesus. And the life that I live, I live in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the law has no hold over me. I love that. You know that he is free from the law, and we are free from the law. Well, that brings us now to uh, chapter 3. Uh, and and I, I kind of synopsize this as the promise to Abraham. Uh, in verse 1, uh, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? And so again, you know, kind of even going back to the first chapter a little bit, Paul is blown away, and I would say even grieved, by um, what the Galatians are doing, what they're entertaining, if you will. And, uh, and so he exclaims to them, I mean, uh, you know, it's got a, my Bible's got an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. He goes, oh, foolish Galatians. And uh, uh, looking it up in a couple different versions, the Amplified Bible lays it out. Oh, you poor and silly and thoughtless and unreflecting and senseless Galatians. <laughs> I think we're getting the point here. But I'll tell you what, the complete Jewish Bible <laughs> cuts to the quick on this one. He says, you stupid Galatians. <laughs> you know, who has put you under a spell? You ever met people, you know, sometimes you just have that phrase stuck in my mind, the mystery of iniquity. You look at people that live their lives in kind of a normal fashion, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the Christian thing, it looks cool. Then all of a sudden it's like, you know, left rudder, you know, and they just go off the deep end somehow. And you just go, what got into them? You know, and you, you just wonder. And that's what Paul's doing. He goes, what's gotten into you? You know, who are you listening to? And um, you know, who's bewitched you? And the answer to that question is pretty easy because even though the Judaizers are, you know, being used of the enemy, the real suspect is Satan himself because Satan is a deceiver. And his goal is to keep God-fearing Christians for being effective witnesses, uh, or even for that matter, get into heaven. You know, and if he can distract somebody or you know, tip, you know, get somebody off you know, their focus or whatever, um, he would do that. And so we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. But in verse 3, he says again, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Because it's the works of the flesh that they were kind of focusing on. And you know, we can't improve on what Jesus has done for us in the Spirit. We can't add to his righteousness with, quote-unquote, our righteousness or you know, our, our futile attempt at self-righteousness. But he asked that question, are you so foolish? And again, the complete Jewish Bible, are you that stupid? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, as we start out in the Spirit, we have to be careful to continue in the Spirit. And, and that's one of the things, you know, I really feel like the Lord's kind of been putting me in check lately. He says, am I your first love? You know, are you doing this for the right reason? You know, I, I love studying my Bible, and I, and I love telling other people about that and teaching and those things, and I, and I love ministering in His name and, and all those things, but I've got to be careful that I really am doing it for Him, not just for my jollies, <laughs> you know, not, not just because that's what I'm supposed to do because you're a pastor. And, and I would say the same to all you guys as well. I, I hope you're here tonight because you love Him. I hope you, you study your Bibles in the morning or whenever you get up and have your devotions because you're devoted to him, not because it's just what you do by rote, you know, and we just kind of go through the motions. We want to be very careful that we're, 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 we're operating in the realm of the Spirit. You know, as, as non-believers, it is one thing for us all to start off in the flesh because that's where we start out. But, it's, but we start off in the flesh, and then we, we move into that spiritual realm when we become born again. And then we've got to stay in that spiritual realm and even being baptized in the Holy Spirit and being used of God and, and, and all those things that we continue to walk in the Spirit. And, and, and if you get to the point where you realize you're not, admit it. Admit it to God anyway and confess that and ask Him, Lord, would you 
Would you pour out your Spirit upon me afresh? Would you renew me in your Spirit, Lord? Would you overwhelm me with your love and joy? Would you help me to walk in the Spirit and, and to do those things that are pleasing to you because I love you and I thank you for saving me? You know, you can never be grateful enough for your salvation. You know, we can never be, uh, we can never thank God enough, honestly, and so it's that constant attempt to please Him. And again, it's because we love Him. But it's also an understanding that we can't do anything good for God uh, or to please God apart from the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us. You know, Zechariah told us in Zechariah 4, 6 that it's not by might and it's not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And, and, and this is the point that Paul is making. Having begun in the Spirit and trusting in Jesus for their salvation, trusting in their faith in Christ uh, to be accounted by God for righteousness, the righteousness which is of Christ through faith, uh, they're now endeavoring by the law to improve on that righteousness. And it's like, how can we improve on it? You know, all, all we can do, honestly, is mess it up. You know, the, if you look at the Ten Commandments, and the, and the Second Commandment says, you know, make no graven images of God, essentially. Nothing on, on, on heaven, from heaven above, earth below, nor, nor bow down to them and worship them. But the premise behind that is that if we try to make a, a picture of God or a statue of God or an image of God in some respect, even if we made the most beautiful statue that mankind has ever seen, it would fall so far short of the reality of God that it would be insulting to God. I mean, all the moms in this room, uh, or, or big sisters even, have had uh, a child or a sibling or a, a nephew or niece or something like that draw a picture of you. And, and they get the crayons out, you know, and they, they just you know, do the, the, the tight-fisted crayon drawing. And they go, look, Mommy, this is you. And you look at them, oh, that's nice. You know, uh, and, and you just, you know, and, and you realize, you know, that you've got more than three hairs on top of your head, you know, and your eyes are on the same, within three inches of each other, you know, and, and you get this whole, you know, Picasso-looking kind of picture uh, that's re- supposed to represent you. And coming from a little child, you know, you're just gracious, and you go, oh, that's nice. But if you had an artist, the, the most skilled person on the planet, present you with a picture that just made you look stupid and ugly, and want to charge you a million bucks for it, <laughs> or whatever, you'd be kind of going, oh, get out of here, you know? you know? What kind of artist are you? But that's kind of like what we try to do sometimes. We, we try to develop this image of God. I mean, I think surfer Jesus looks pretty cool. Blonde hair, blue eyes, wind blowing, you know? Reminds me of me. No, not really. <laughs> but I mean, I think, I think those, the, 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 the surfer Jesus pictures look pretty cool. But as handsome as that guy is, that's not God. You know, and, it's, and it's not even a good depiction of him. It might be a good depiction of a human being, but not of a God who's high and lifted up and beyond all that. And so we've got to be careful in the same respect that we don't try to improve on the gospel of Jesus because that's, it's blasphemy. The righteousness of, of Christ is complete. And that was the error, really, of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the people of that day trying to develop a righteous standing before God by uh, their own merit, by their own self-righteousness, which really isn't righteousness at all. You know, Paul, in this chapter, Paul goes on to um, use Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar uh, as examples of walking in the Spirit. You know, they're producing offspring in the Spirit who are free as opposed to offspring in the flesh who are in bondage. And then, then in, in verse 24, uh, Paul gives us an example of, uh, or not an example, but he gives us the purpose, if you will, of the law. In verse 24, it says, Therefore the law was our tutor, or in King James, our schoolmaster, uh, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And so the law became our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us to faith, uh, driving us, if you will, to the cross. Uh, The whole purpose of the law was to show us that we were failures. (laughs) Uh, The purpose of the law is to show us that we're sinners and and that we would come to that place where we would see our need for a Savior. You know, getting a pardon doesn't mean anything unless you realize that you're being convicted of a crime. You know, uh, getting a, a get-out-of-jail-free card means nothing unless you've got handcuffs on. <laughs> you know, then it means something. And then uh, verse 28, uh, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, uh, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, uh, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so uh, Paul kind of lays out, because the Jews thought they were superior to the Gentiles. And even the, the quote-unquote Jewish believers had this idea, the Judaizers in particular, that somehow they had an edge on the non-Jewish Gentile you know, believers. 
And so Paul kind of lays out, you know, there's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither bond or free, there's neither male or female. We are all one, we are all equal in Christ Jesus. And you know, uh, I've heard many uh, uh, an accolade, uh, you know, describing um, uh, Billy Graham or Pastor Chuck or a bunch of different famous teachers and preachers and godly men, no doubt. But you know what? At the foot of the cross, we're on the same level. And, you know, and if you're the, 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 the most uh, a newbie believer, you know, hot off the press, uh, you have the same standing as uh, the Apostle Paul, for that matter. You know, and so we're all one. We're all equal. We have an equal standing in Christ Jesus. And the things that previously separated us no longer do. I love being in fellowship because of all the mixed bag of nuts, nuts that God kind of brings together. Uh, he, God likes variety. And so he throws us together. And many of us have different lifestyles, different attitudes about things, all kinds of stuff. But what's the common thing that, 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 that draws us all together? Jesus. He, he's that thread that runs through all of our lives. And that's why we get along so well. Anyway, uh, that brings us to chapter 4. And uh, chapter 4, I kind of gave it the heading, uh, Freedom from the Law. Um, because that's kind of what Paul, I think, describes. Uh, in verses 4 and 5, he says, uh, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are made under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so, uh, when the fullness of the time had come, essentially at the predicted time, in the predicted way, at the predicted place. I like that. You know, again, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. And then it says, he came to redeem us. He didn't came to advise us. You know, he didn't can't come to, to hang out. He came with a point in mind that he was going to redeem us, uh, to redeem those who were under the law, who were condemned by the law, and he came to pay the price for us. You know, he paid the redemption price. Uh, Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. <laughs> and you know what? He got to, got to the earth and the, the planet's full of them. <laughs> You have to seek and you have to, didn't have to seek too hard because they're all, we're all over the place. In uh, verse eleven, it says, uh, Paul says, "I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain." Paul is concerned for their spiritual well-being. And he's hoping that he hasn't wasted his time with them. You know, if you've been walking with the Lord uh, for any amount of time, and you've met other believers, you know, and, and some are, some are strong believers. Some maybe are having you know, some more issues in their life. Maybe they're not as strong or, or as grounded or whatever. But there are times when we'll, we'll maybe try to help a brother or sister and you get to a point where you realize you're concerned for them. You know, you're, you're praying for them. You hope that they'll get past the, uh, the trial they're going through. They, they get past perhaps uh, the, the crisis in their faith or, or different things. And there's times when we see people struggling spiritually and we begin to pray for them, hopefully more earnestly, uh, because you see, they're in danger. And, and that's where exactly where Paul is. He's concerned for their salvation because as you toy with these things, and he's going to say it pretty clearly here in a, in a couple of verses. He said, man, if, if you think you're going to go this route, you're not saved. And so it, it is concerning. Uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And so it is a one-way ticket in a certain sense. We've got to keep moving forward. Because if we draw back, that's not going to, God's not going to be happy with that. And so we don't want to be in that category of, quote-unquote, you know, backsliding. Uh, in, in chapter 5, uh, I call this righteousness by faith. In verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, you know, stand firm, you know, hang on tight. And, and I've watched sometimes these, uh, these movies, you know, where they show these ships at sea and uh, big storms, storms are raging and all that kind of stuff. And you see these guys out there, they're not just out walking around, do 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 whistling and stuff. They're hanging on to the rail. They're hanging on to the catwalks. They're hanging on to ropes or something because, you know what, if sometimes during those storms, if you don't hang on, you're going to get tossed overboard. And so... You know, he's telling them, stand fast, stand firm. You know, Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. He said that we should no longer be children 
tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. I really believe this is part of why we need to be grounded in God's word. Because people are going to come at times, we are going to be tested in some of these things. And we need to study, you know, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Like I was telling my brother the other day, he was, he was so wrapped up in, you know, his own moral standard of he really, he really values the truth and he really wants to, you know, hang his hat on the truth. And so, well, you know what? The coolest thing is when you know the truth, you'll recognize the lies. You know, and, and you'll recognize the lies of this world. And, and Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you be my disciples indeed. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth sets us free from sin. The truth sets us free from death. But it also sets us free from the lies of this world. You know, they're, they don't have an effect on us anymore. And so basically know what you believe and why you believe it. You know, we've been set free from uh, the bondage of sin and death, set free from religion and, and from the law. And we don't need to get tangled up in that again. I have to be honest with you, there's times when my family, my extended family, uh, wants me to go back and, 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 and be with them during certain occasions uh, that involve things with the Roman Catholic Church. And I have to tell you, I'm really leery of that. I don't want to get tangled up in the old stuff. You know, it, it'd be like going back and say, hey, you know, uh, and getting involved in some of the fleshly things that I did before I got saved. I don't want to get tangled up in that either. Uh, to me, it, it's all kind of part and parcel. And so when we've been set free from those entanglements, uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to be caught up in it again. You know, Paul told Timothy in, in, in 2 Timothy 2.4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So hang on to that liberty that we've been given. Don't let it go. And, and that's kind of why he's uh, quasi kind of rebuking the Galatians because it appears that they were entertaining these thoughts and on the verge of letting go of their liberty. You know, um, Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 2, 3, and 4, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, uh, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, which is self-righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I don't want my righteousness. It'll do me no good. What I want, what I need, is His righteousness covering me. Because my righteousness stinks. There's nothing good about it. And so... The righteousness of God is what saves us. Uh, in verse 2, he says, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you uh, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. This is a heavy verse. Paul is warning them that if they get circumcised in an attempt to gain a better standing with God to somehow ensure their salvation, uh, or to somehow fulfill the law in an attempt to be righteous, then they will lose his righteousness, okay, which is <laughs> losing righteousness, period, and, and the sacrifice of Christ will profit them nothing. This is just a, a, an intricate way of saying if Jesus' is sacrifice, if his righteousness is an account of them, then he is of no profit to them, that means they're lost. That means they're standing with their own righteousness on, the, on that last day. And that's not going to cover it. That's not going to take care of things. In verse 4, Paul says, uh, You've become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. Paul is saying that if we attempt to justify ourselves by keeping the law, we become estranged from Christ and have fallen from grace. You know, uh, we read in Ephesians 2, uh, 5, and 8, for by grace you're saved. And I would just put in parentheses next to that, or not at all. You know, the, it, you guys maybe have heard that, that saying, that phrase, know Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, then no peace, K-N-O-W, peace, then no Jesus, N-O, Jesus, N-O, no peace. And I would tell you, no grace no salvation. That's what Paul's laying out. We're either saved by grace or we're not saved at all. And so to add works to it is just uh, it's wrecking it. 
It's perverting it. Uh, in verse 8, uh, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. <laughs> they didn't get this idea from the Bible. They didn't get this idea from Jesus. They might have got it from the angel Moroni. They might have got it, got it from some, some false prophet out in the world, okay, but it didn't come from Jesus. And so um, it's amazing the things that people will come up with. And I've told people before, you know, you're not going to come to that conclusion by reading the Bible, you know, by studying the Bible. And then I want to just draw your attention uh, lastly here in chapter 5 to verse 16. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walk in the Spirit. That's, it's kind of an imperative almost. Do this. Move in the Spirit. Live and abide in the Spirit. You know, he goes on to describe the works of the flesh as opposed to the fruit of the Spirit. And it's kind of interesting. As we've gone through this book, the works are considered fleshly or evil, right? Bad. And so it's the works of the flesh. And it goes on down this long list of sins. But then when you get to the fruit of the Spirit, that's different. See, work involves effort, you know, and it's our effort. But fruit is just what happens naturally in a person's life when they're walking in the Spirit. You don't have to, you, know, you don't hear the, the apple tree out in the backyard groaning and moaning trying to produce fruit. You know, it just happens. And so, um, so uh, walk in the Spirit and deny the, the lust of the flesh. Uh, that brings us down to chapter 6. Uh, and I, I kind of just titled this uh, Freedom in Christ, you know, that describes that. Uh, in verse 1, I love this. He's been rebuking them. He's been correcting them. But the first word he uses there is brethren. Uh, he's talking to fellow believers. And what I like about that, when he says brethren, they're still connected. They're still related. He still loves them. And in my mind, as he uses this, this specific phrase of endearment, there's still hope. In other words, they haven't gone over the edge yet. Maybe they, have, they haven't made their final decision. They haven't gone down that path you know, where it's irrecoverable. There is still hope. He says, brethren. And, and, and I like that because he is moving towards the, uh, the, the farewell part of this letter. But, you know, there's still hope. He's described the works of the flesh. And he's talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Now he moves forward in the Spirit, addressing uh, really the ministry of restoration. And that is helping people to be reconciled to God, encourage them to walk in the Spirit. Because there's, I'm, I'm sure in the, in the churches of Galatia, there are some that are right on still. They're, they're, they're moving the way, in the Spirit the way God you know, intended them to, the way they were taught by Paul. There are probably some uh, that have kind of started you know, going back to keeping the Sabbath and you know, maybe getting circumcised. Who knows what? Some aspect of the law. And the next thing he talks about is restoration. How do you restore somebody? And all you really do is you, you just take their hand and you put it in the hand of Jesus. You know, say, hey, you know, you can, you can pray and ask for forgiveness. You know, you, you can realize the error of your ways and repent of that and turn around and go another direction. And so that he starts off, if a man is overtaken and they trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Help them, guide them, point them in the right direction. And, and that's what we're called to do. You know, and, and, and do it in humility because considering yourself lest you also be tempted. And so he's going to have some kind of final exhortations here. Uh, in verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. You know, help each other out. Uh, in verse 3, he says, For if anyone thinks of himself some, uh, uh, to be something when he is nothing. In other words, he's encouraging them to walk in humility, not to be arrogant about anything. Uh, in verse 6, one of my personal favorites, uh, he says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So support your local pastor. Um, uh, in verses 7 and 8, he kind of, again, part of the exhortation, he gives a warning. You know, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so uh, a warning and an exhortation, I think, there. Don't be deceived. You know, be careful, you know, what you sow. Uh, because that's what you're going to reap. And so you want to make sure that you sow to the Spirit as opposed to the flesh. You know, we've got to be careful. Sometimes I think we don't even realize at times what we're sowing. You know, we're, we're just moving along, 
and we might realize down the road somewhere, but we've got to kind of be circumspect in those kinds of things. Uh, in verse 9, he says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. So bottom line is, don't lose heart. You know, keep plowing, keep sowing, keep moving forward in the Spirit, trusting that God will make it fruitful. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, nothing that we do for the Lord is done in vain. You know, that he'll, he'll use it if we're seeking to please Him. And then in verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so as we have opportunity, do good. Do the right thing. You know, like in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, you know, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so the, the exhortation is simply just to do good. Then the last few verses here, I'm just going to read this last passage beginning at verse 14. He says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And so Paul kind of reiterates that we don't have anything to brag about. <laughs> he did it all. If we're going to brag, we've got to brag in him. And then I would just kind of go back again to, to Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And then I love that final benediction there in verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That's a good way to end. That's a nice blessing. And so we've got this, uh, this letter to the Galatians uh, where we are encouraged, obviously, to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, that we're encouraged to trust uh, and, and receive, really, the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, and because we believe in him, God accounts that to us as righteousness, but to trust what his word says about that and simply to be yielded to him. Oh, yeah. I guess I put that last little part there. Uh, by finishing off Galatians tonight, uh, we hit 70.2% of the Bible complete. And so, I don't know, I'm kind of happy about that too. So anyway, not that anyone's keeping score, but, uh, <laughs> but somebody is. Anyway. Father God, thank you, Lord, for uh, your love and your kindness. Thank you, Father, for uh, your imputed righteousness. Uh, thank you, Father, for your sacrifice that makes that possible. And, Lord, we rejoice in you tonight, and we ask that you would help us simply uh, to trust in you all the more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and continue to worship.
song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay so teach my song so teach my song to rise to you Father, we acknowledge you as our hope, our stay, Lord, our righteousness, Lord, the only truth we'll ever know, the best life that there'll ever be. Lord, you're everything to us, and we rejoice in you tonight. We ask, Lord, that you'd be glorified in our, in our hearts and our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto me. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up His countenance, His countenance upon thee, and give. Well, God bless you guys. Pray you have a restful, peaceful night tonight. That uh, again, you just kind of wake up, fired up, freshed up, and ready to go. And that the Lord just kind of keeps putting in, in your heart and your mind just how much He loves you. He loves you so much. God bless you guys. Have a good night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. I'd, I'd love to pray with you.